He said, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So inshallah, this will be the last session uh, commenting on the ahadith dealing with the maintaining the ties of kinship, the importance of it, and the severity of breaking the ties of kinship. And just as a reminder, last session we had covered the hadith of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, لَيْسَ الْوَاسِلُ بِالْمُكَافِئِ وَلَكِنَّ الْوَاسِلَ الَّذِي إِذَا قُطِعَةُ رَحِمُهُ وَصَلَاهَا The one who maintains the ties of kinship is not the one who reciprocates, meaning who gives like for like. If they visit you, you visit them. If they're good to you, you're good to them. Rather, the one who maintains the ties of kinship is the one who, when his relatives cut him off, he still maintains his ties of kinship. And we had discussed the hadith last week also, that a Bedouin man came to our messenger Sallallahu alayhi wasallam And he said, Messenger of Allah, Prophet of Allah Teach me an action Which will enable me to enter paradise Teach me an action Which will enable me to enter paradise And so our Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wasallam Approved of this, of this question And he said This question Even though it may seem simple It's actually a very deep question It's a very broad question And so he said in answer to this question, free a soul and set a slave free. And so the Bedouin said, "Are they not the same thing? Freeing a slave and slave and setting a sorry, freeing a soul and setting a slave free." And so the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied, "No. Freeing someone is setting someone free by yourself, and setting a slave free is to contribute to the price of setting him free." And then the Messenger of Allah kept on went on to say. And also lend an animal for milking, which has lots of milk. And treat your relatives kindly. And treat your relatives kindly. And if you cannot do that, if you cannot do any of this, then command the good and forbid the evil. And if you cannot even do that, then restrain your tongue from anything except that which is good. From saying anything except that which is good. So these are the two hadith we commented on last session. And today we're going to cover a chapter entitled Bab Man Wasala Rahimahu Fil Jahiliya Thumma Aslam. The one who maintained the ties of kinship in the days of Jahiliya, meaning while he was a non Muslim, and then became a Muslim. The one who maintains the ties of kinship while he was a non Muslim, and then after this he became a Muslim. So it's reported that Hakim ibn Hizam said أنه قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أرأيت أمورا كنت أتحنث بها في الجاهلية من سلة وأتاقة وصدقة فهل لي فيها أجر قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أسلمت على ما سلف من خير So Hakim ibn Hizam he went to the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and he said, what is your opinion? What's your view on those good things I used to do before I was a Muslim? Fil Jahiliya, in the days of Jahiliya. Such as maintaining the ties of kinship, maintaining relations with my relatives. Such as setting slaves free. Such as my sadaqah that I used to give, that I used to give the charity I used to give. And another narration is mentioned that he would still do that after Islam. So the same things he was doing before Islam, he was still doing them after Islam, meaning after he had accepted Islam. Do you think I will get rewarded for those actions? So the Hakim ibn Hizam is asking Allah's Messenger this question. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, When you become a Muslim, you keep the good actions you have already done. In the days you were not a Muslim. Aslamta ala ma salafa min khair. That when you become a Muslim, you keep the good actions you have already done. Now, there's two things I want to cover here today. One is related to the hadith, and one is the actual point of the hadith itself. And the point that's related to this hadith is that it's established in the texts of Islam that Allah recognizes the good that non-Muslims do. Okay, it's a very important point for us to understand. Allah recognizes the good that non-Muslims do. And the way he recognizes the good that the non-Muslims do 
is that if they, if they remain upon their disbelief throughout their entire lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them their reward for their good in this life. He gives them their reward for their good in this life. Our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Allah does not deal unjustly with a believer about a good deed that he has done. He has given the blessings for it in this world and he is rewarded for it in the hereafter. But the disbeliever, Allah is still not unjust to the disbeliever. Allah is also just to the disbeliever. It is our belief that Allah as Lord of the worlds, as part and parcel of his justice, is that he is not unjust to anybody, Muslim or non-Muslim. He's not unjust to anything as well, animal or inanimate object. So the disbeliever, he is given in this life the reward for the good deeds he has performed. But when it comes to the hereafter, there is no good deed for which he can be rewarded. There is no good deed for which he can be rewarded. So for, our, for us, the, the disbeliever, he gets rewarded for the good he does in this life. But in the hereafter, the only good that Allah accepts, and the only good that Allah recognizes and has weight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that good that resulted from Iman. That good which is a consequence of Iman. Any other type of good deed that is done has no value in the hereafter. The only thing of value in the hereafter is Iman and the actions that come out of Iman. Uh, Allah mentions about the deeds of the disbelievers in the hereafter. وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَىٰ مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا And we, sh we shall turn to whatever deeds the disbelievers did. And we shall make them as scattered floating particles of dust. We shall make them like scattered floating particles of dust. Meaning weightless and useless. And likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again talking about the hereafter, as for those who disbelieve in our signs, in our revelation, and they disbelieve in the meeting of the hereafter, habitat a'maluhum, their deeds are nothing. Their deeds are vain and destroyed. Are they to be requited or rewarded for anything except what they used to do? So for the disbeliever, who remains in his disbelief, the deeds that he did in this life of goodness, charity, being good to other people, helping the poor, all of these sorts of things, Allah rewards him in this life. But in the hereafter, he has no reward. If that disbeliever accepts Islam, if that disbeliever accepts Islam, the reward of those deeds he did as a non-Muslim is carried through. And Allah will reward him for those deeds as a Muslim, and his sins are forgiven. His previous sins are forgiven from the point that he accepts Islam. But the good deeds he did before accepting Islam are carried through. And Allah will reward them for, for him, in, will reward him for them in this life and the next. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that if a person accepts Islam and makes his Islam good, meaning he practices Islam, and follows on from the implications of the shahada la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That if he does this, Allah will decree reward for every good deed that he did before he became a Muslim. And every bad deed he did before he became a Muslim will be erased. Then after that will come the reckoning. In the hereafter, each good deed will be rewarded 10 times up to 700 times. And each bad deed will be rewarded as it is. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to forgive that sin. So this hadith shows us, as the title hadith is of Hakim ibn Hizam, that the good deeds that a non-Muslim who accepted Islam did are carried through and they're rewarded by Allah both in this life and the next. As a part and parcel of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a part and parcel or consequence of his generosity. Likewise, if a Christian or a Jew, meaning someone who had previously received a scripture, or follow the religion that previously uh, arose from a scripture, if he accepted Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will double that person's reward. Again, out of his mercy, out of his generosity, out of his kindness. Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu anhu, he said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are three types of people who will be given double reward. So they earn their reward, 
and then Allah will double that reward. A man from amongst the Ahlul Kitab, a man from amongst the Ahlul Kitab, meaning a Jew or a Christian, who believed in his Prophet and then lived to see our Prophet وسلم, and followed him and believed in him. Such a person will have double reward. So a Jew or a Christian who believed in his own Prophet and then lived to see our Prophet والسلام, or accepted Islam after his passing away, believed in him and followed him, such a person gets double reward. And a slave who fulfills his duty towards Allah and towards his master. He fulfills his duty towards Allah and towards his master. Such a person will get double reward. And a man who had a slave woman. So in those days, slavery was existent and prevalent. And so a man who had a slave woman. And he treated her well. And he fed her well. And he taught her. Meaning he educated her. And he educated her well. And then he set her free and married her. Such a person will get double reward. Such a person will get double reward. So who are the three people mentioned in this hadith that will get double reward? Who are the three? The kitabi who... His prophet and then believed in the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Go on. A slave that is dutiful to Allah and dutiful to his master. A slave that is dutiful to Allah and dutiful to his master. And? A man that raised his slave, fed her, and then set her free and married her. Yeah, a man who slave raised his slave, treated his slave woman well, fed her, clothed her well, educated her, set her free, and then married her. He has to be a Muslim. Yes. So, this hadith shows us that the, amongst the deeds that Allah accepts from a, a non-Muslim who became a Muslim is maintaining the ties of kinship. So, a non-Muslim who, who maintained the ties of kinship, once he accepts Islam, Allah will reward him for those, that deed of maintaining the ties of kinship that he did before accepting Islam. And a final point about this hadith is that the Sahaba understood from the very question that he's asking that will, my, will I get rewarded for the deeds I did before Islam? They understood that shirk and kufr destroys deeds, which is what the ayah is talking about. They understood this fact that shirk and kufr destroys deeds. And the Quran is very clear about this. So Hakim ibn Hizam is asking this question, okay, I understand this fact, but what about, the what about if I became a Muslim? And accepted Islam. What about my good deeds then? So it's a given that a non-Muslim's good deeds are, are destroyed in the hereafter. But what about a non-Muslim who accepts Islam? So the point being is the Sahaba understood this premise. That the, the deeds of a non-Muslim or the deeds of a person who is in shirk and kufr are not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. So to repeat the hadith. What is your view about the acts of worship or the good things I used to do in the times of Jahiliyyah? Maintaining relations with relatives, setting slaves free, and giving charity. Will they bring me a reward? And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Aslamta ala ma salafa min khair. That when you became Muslim, when you become Muslim, you keep the good deeds you have already done. When you become a Muslim, you keep the good deeds you have already done. So the next... Uh, Chapter heading that Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah brings. Bab Silatu the Rahim al Mushrik wal Hadiya. Maintaining the ties of kinship with a Mushrik, meaning you have relatives who are non Muslims, Kufar or Mushriks, polytheists, and giving them gifts. And here Imam Bukhari brings a hadith we covered already in the beginning of this chapter, in the beginning of this book. That Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu an saw a silk robe for sale. And he said, Messenger of Allah, why don't you buy this robe and wear it on Jumu'ah and wear it when delegations come to visit you? It's a nice robe and we meant to wear nice clothes on Jumu'ah. And Umar bin al-Khattab understood this. So he's saying to the Messenger of Allah, why don't you wear this nice silk robe, buy, buy this nice silk robe and wear it on Jumu'ah? And whenever you get visitations, because delegations of people would come to visit the Prophet, you know, leaders would come or, or 
delegation on behalf of leaders would come to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. So why don't you wear this nice clothes when, when they come to visit you? And so the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, only a person who has no portion in the next world would wear this garment. Only a person who has no portion in the next world would wear this garment. And this is because, as I'm sure we all know, silk garments are haram for men to wear, and they are halal for women to wear. The Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, holding up some silk garments, these are haram for the males of my ummah, but permitted for the females of my ummah. These garments are haram for the males of my ummah, but per- permitted for the females of my ummah. And he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, said, that silk is only worn in this world by one who will have no share in the pleasure of the hereafter. Silk is only worn in this world by one, meaning a male, who will have no share of the pleasure of the hereafter. So the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said, uh, only a poor person who has no portion in the next world could wear this. And then later on, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasalam, was donated or given some robes made of silk as a gift. And he sent these robes to Umm bin al-Khattab. So he was given these, go- these robes of silk as a gift and he sent these robes to Umm bin al-Khattab. And Umar now is confused, right? Umar is obviously confused. He's heard what the Messenger of Allah said about silk clothes, and now he suddenly received a gift from the Messenger of Allah, which are silk clothes. And so he came running to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "How can I wear these when you have said what you said about silk clothes?" And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied, "I didn't give you these garments for you to wear. I gave them to you because you can donate them, you can gift them to somebody else." Or you can sell them and benefit from the, the price of these, of these garments. And so Umar bin al-Khattab, an, he sent it to one of his, he gifted these garments to one of his half-brothers from his mother. So his half-brother from his mother, who was still a mushrik. So Umar bin al-Khattab an, sent these garments as a gift to one of his half-brothers who was still a mushrik. And this is why Imam Bukhari quotes this hadith here. Because it shows that the Sahaba... Umar bin al-Khattab would give gifts to their non-Muslim relatives and to their non-Muslim family. And they would maintain their ties of kinship with their non-Muslim family and their non-Muslim relatives. Any questions? Yeah? Yes, the um, silk that was um, around for the male Muslim, but it's okay to give to, uh, the yeah, so that's a very good question. We covered it last time we covered this hadith. And uh, the answer is no. We can't give it. The reason why Umar bin Khattab gave it to his brother, half brother, was not for his half brother to wear, but for his half brother to either give it to the women of his family or to sell, sell on himself. Okay? It's not allowed for something that's haram for men as Muslims to give the item to non Muslims. Or for women. If somebody has haram for us as Muslims, we can't give that item to non-Muslims. Yeah, it's still haram, full stuff, you're not allowed to deal with it. But if an item can be used in both a halal way and a haram way, then it's permissible for us to sell that item. So say for example, uh, we cover like silk garments for example. Women can wear them, but men can't wear them. Okay, so I can sell garments because it can be used in both ways. I'm not required to ask the question of somebody coming to me to buy this gar- a garment from me, is it for men or is it for women? That's not my responsibility now, right? So an item that it can be used both ways, it's not our responsibility to investigate how it's going to be used by, this, by, the, by the purchaser. So I'm allowed to sell these items. Likewise, like televisions or radios or phones or whatever, right? They can be used in good and they can use in, be used in bad ways. Because it can be used both ways, we can sell these items and we're not required to investigate from, you know, ask questions or interrogate the people who come to us you know, to buy them, how are you going to use them? But an item that can only be used in a haram way, like alcohol, for example, like drinking you know, wine or beer or whatever, we can't sell it full stop. Yeah. So, part of it, you get food and stuff, and you check that at home, and you realize that it's got pork or all that stuff, so you can't give that to your children. No. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Give to 
If it's a halal gift, then and it's your habit to give gifts to your neighbor, then that's fine. Uh, however, if it's not your habit to give gifts to your neighbor, then it's better to delay it so you don't really confuse the occasion. Yeah, so give it before or after or whatever. But if you know some neighbors, like you always, give, they give some of their food to their neighbors or they give these uh, gifts to the neighbors. If that's like a normal habit, then that's fine. Yeah. What constitutes as somebody who you need to, you know, keep the ties of kinship with? Is it your brother or sister, or is it your cousin or second cousin? It's um uh, obviously you haven't been to previous sessions, but um who can actually no? I'm not going to answer that question. It's really your parents. Yeah. Your parents, Anybody. Who is connected to you through your parents? That's the ties of ties of kinship. So that's you know the relations that would not exist were not for your parents. Yeah, so that's quite quite a broad, wide range. Now, actually, when I because I listened to a commentary by Sheikh Omar Mukbil to this book before I before I uh, obviously before I give these classes in preparation for these classes, and he actually said something very interesting. I've not actually read in any of the classical works, but that's probably due to my lack of reading. And he said that the ties of kinship, there's the obligatory ties of kinship, and there's a recommended ties of kinship. I, from amongst the relatives, there are, there's that circle of relatives that's obligatory for you to maintain ties of kinship with, and then there's a wider circle where it's recommended for you to tie, maintain ties of kinship with. As I said, I mean, this is what he said, so I'm just, I'm just going to quote it. Um, obviously, he's not going to be saying it from, from, from you know, making it up. He said, how do you, what's the principle for determining what, who is who, or which circle a relative falls into? So he said that any... If you're a male, any female that you're not allowed to marry, it's obligatory for you to maintain ties of kinship with. And any male, were they to be a female that you're not allowed to marry, and you can't marry them, it's obligatory to, for you to maintain ties of kinship with. Likewise for the female, the other way around. And then anybody who falls outside of that circle, it's recommended to tie, or strongly recommended to maintain ties of kinship with. So effectively that means, you know, the, obviously the parents and going up, grandparents, and the, the line of uncles, and aunts, and then uh, uh, that's pretty much the relatives that we're not allowed to marry, and they would be the ones that's obligatory to maintain, obligatory to maintain ties of kinship. And then anybody else from the wider circle would be strongly recommended, but not obligatory. As I said, this is what he said. It's very interesting. It does make sense from some aspects, but I would, I would like to read it myself in like, like classical works before properly promoting it. Go on. Uh, yeah. outlaws, yeah. We've mentioned this before that the outlaws in those uh, don't strictly fall within the ties of kinship because they don't fall in the, within the definition of the relations that would exist where the, because of your parents, yeah, unless they, they, they're your cousins or whatever in the first place. But um, that doesn't mean you don't need to treat your in-laws well, but that's falling under a separate category, yeah, not falling under the, the category we're fall, uh, discussing in these circles. Okay, so the next chapter and the final chapter of these uh, of these uh, hadith. Bab ta'allamu min ansabikum min asab min ansabikum ma tasiluna bihi arhamakum. Learn your lineages so that you can maintain ties of kinship. Learn your lineages so you can maintain ties of kinship. So the point that's being stressed in the hadith we're about to uh, quote so in in this chapter is that our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged us to learn about our lineage, about a genealogy, about a family tree. Why? Because we will then know who we need to maintain ties of kinship with and who we don't have to maintain ties of kinship with, i.e. or those who fall outside of the, the circle of relatives. So, Umar bin al-Khattab, he quotes, Umar bin al-Khattab, it's a narration of Umar, that he would say upon the minbar, when he's giving a khutbah, تَعَلَّمُوا أَنْسَابَكُمْ ثُمَّ سِلُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ وَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لِيَكُونُ بَيْنَ الرَّجُلِ وَبَيْنَ أَخِيهِ الشَّيْءِ وَلَوْ يَعْلَمُ الَّذِي بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ مِنْ دَاخِلَةِ الرَّحِمِ لَأُوزَعَهُ ذَلِكَ عَنْ انْتِهَاكِهِ That Umar bin Khattab would say on the member, Learn your lineages, then maintain your ties of kinship. Learn your lineages, so that, so that you maintain your ties of kinship. By Allah, if there, are some, if there are some bad feelings between a man and his brother, and he realizes what is truly between them of kinship, that in itself will prevent them, will prevent him from breaking off, breaking off relations with his brother. Okay. So, 
And it's actually, if you think about this statement, it's very, very powerful, very, it's an amazing statement. Because the Sahaba understood, they understood so well the importance of maintaining the ties of kinship that in their minds, just this fact alone was enough to maintain them. Just the fact alone that he's my relative was enough in their minds that they have to maintain the ties of kinship. Yeah. Unlike many of us today, right? Just this fact alone, it's really quite amazing. Just this fact alone, he is my relative, I have to maintain ties of kinship. This was our attitude. So by Allah, if there are some bad feelings between a man and his brother, and he realizes what is between them of kinship, that in itself would prevent him from breaking off relations with him. And in a similar vein, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Learn of your genealogies. It's a weak hadith, this particular one, but its meaning is authentic. Learn of your genealogies such amount as would allow you to join the ties of kinship. And then stop. Meaning, don't delve too deeply into genealogies. You don't have to become like going to the tiny details of genealogies. Learn of the Arabic language such amount as would allow you to understand Allah's book and then stop. Meaning, again, don't go into going into minute details is only for the select few. We just need to learn enough to understand Allah's book. And of course, this is the purpose of learn, for us to learn the Arabic language. The main purpose, the, focus, the primary purpose, is to understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn of astronomy such amount as would allow you to travel in the darkness of land and sea and then stop. Meaning again, don't go too deeply into it. So all of these sciences are recommended for us to learn. And indeed some of the Sahaba were you know, learned in these sciences. But the Messenger of Allah generally recommended not going too much into detail. Don't go into too much detail in these sciences. So this hadith, learn your lineages, or this narration rather, learn your lineages so that you can maintain your ties of kinship. By Allah, if there are some bad feelings between a man and his brother, and he realizes what is truly between them of kinship, that in itself would prevent him from breaking off relations with him. And then the next hadith Imam Bukhari quotes, from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, again a narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, اِحْفَذُوا أَنْسَابَكُمْ تَسِلُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ لَا بُعْدَ بِالرَّحِمِ إِذَا قَرُبَتْ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ بَعِيدَةً وَلَا قُرْبَ بِهَا إِذَا بَعُدَتْ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ قَرِيبَةً وَكُلُّ رَحِمٍ آتِيَةٌ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَمَامَ صَاحِبِهَا تَشْهَدُ لَهُ بِسِلَةٍ إِنْ كَانَ وَصَلَهَا وَعَلَيْهِ بِقَطِيَةٍ إِنْ كَانَ قَطَعَهَا That Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma he says Learn your lineages so that you can maintain your ties of kinship There is no distance to ties of kinship when they are brought close even if they are actually distant relatives. What he means by this is that you have distant relatives, but if you maintain ties of kinship and you deal, them well, deal with them well, they come close to you. So there's no distance to ties of kinship when they're brought close, meaning you can bring the, far, the distant relative close to you. Likewise, there's no, dis, there is no, uh, there's no closeness if they are kept distant by not maintaining ties, even if they are actually close relatives. So even if they are close relatives to you, or if they are close relatives to you, and you do not maintain ties of kinship, there's no closeness. You've not fulfilled the obligation of maintaining the ties of kinship with that individual. And then he says, every tie of kinship will come on the day of rising, on the day of judgment, with uh, its individual, with, the, with, that, with, with the, its individual. And it will testify on his behalf if he maintained the ties of kinship. And it will testify against him if he cut them off. It will testify on his behalf uh, if he maintained the ties of kinship. And it will testify against him if he cut them off. So this narration of Ibn Abbas, عنهما, which Imam Bukhari quotes here, is actually quoted as a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a Tayalisi. And some scholars said it's authentic, this hadith. Other scholars said it's weak. And it seems that Imam Bukhari viewed that this hadith is weak, which is why he didn't quote it and prefer the words of Ibn Abbas instead. Uh, but both these hadith, what are they teaching us? They're teaching us that we are being encouraged to learn our lineage, to learn our family trees, so that we can make, find out who our relatives are, so that we can ensure that we maintain our ties of kinship. And this is very important for us to do. Find out your families, find out who your relatives are, so that you can maintain the ties of kinship. 
And we learn that from this, from this hadith that a ties of kinship on the Day of Judgment will bear testimony for us or against us. And we've already covered a hadith where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that inna rahima shajnatun min ar-Rahman that the ties of kinship are intricately, intricately connected to ar-Rahman, the Lord of Mercy. تَقُولْ يَا رَبِّ إِنِّي ظُلِمْتُ يَا رَبِّ إِنِّي قُطِئْتُ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ إِنِّي إِنِّي It will say to Allah My Lord, I have been wronged. My Lord, I have been cut off. My Lord, I have, I have. Listing the things that were done wrong, how it's been, been dealt with unjustly. And Allah will respond to the ties of kinship. So the ties of kinship will speak on the last day and Allah will respond. Showing us that the ties of kinship, its words have weight with Allah. They have significance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah will respond. أَلَا تَرَدَيْنَا أَنْ أَقْتَعَ مَنْ قَتَعَكِ وَأَسِلَ مَنْ وَصَلَكِ Are you not content that I will cut off the one who cuts you off? And I will maintain connections with the one who maintains connections with you. Are you not content that I will cut off the one who cuts you off? And I will maintain connections with the one who maintains connections with you. So, learn our lineage and learn our family tree and find out who our relatives are. And the goal, as I said, of learning the lineage is so that we can know who to maintain relations with, who to keep ties with. It is not as some people do, wali billah, to lord over other people, to boast about their lineage, to somehow gain position over somebody else. This is not what the purpose of learning lineage is. In fact, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he condemned this attitude. Condemned making yourself out to be better than somebody else because you have a, if you like, a more refined or a more, more noble descent, a more noble lineage. Or you have an exalted or a lofty lineage or you have rich people in your family or you have people who are people of prestige in your family. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَرْبَعٌ فِي أُمَّتِي مِنْ أَمْرِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ لَا يَتْرُكُونَهُنَّ there are four things in my ummah that are from the affairs of jahiliyyah, that they are from the affairs of ignorance. And my ummah will not leave them. They will always be there in my ummah to some extent or another. Al Fakhru fil Ahsab, pride in a noble descent. Wa ta'anu fil Ansab, and cursing lineage, cursing other people's lineage. So you take pride in your own lineage and you curse other people's lineage for being too lowly. For being uh, beneath you. Wal istisqa'u bin nujum and seeking rain through stars, astrology, or example of astrology, wal niyaha and wailing over the dead. And wailing over the dead. So there are four matters of jahiliyyah that are in my ummah and they will not leave. They'll still remain. Pride in noble descent, cursing lineage, seeking rain through stars, and wailing over the dead. So the Messenger of Allah condemned this attitude. So when he is encouraging us to learn about lineage, it's not for this reason. And likewise, we need to understand that our lineage is not a reason for our success, it's not a reason for our failure. Again, a very important point for us to understand. We may have righteous people amongst our lineage. They may be, we may have scholars amongst our lineage. We may have saints amongst our lineage, Allah knows best. But just because we have saints or scholars or whatever in our lineage, doesn't mean that I'm going to be a successful person. I'm held responsible for what I do myself, not for what my parents or grandparents or whatever they did. Likewise, we may have evil people in our lineage, but just because I, have evil, I may have evil people in, in my ancestry, it doesn't mean that I'm going to become, become an evil person. You can have good people as a result of coming from the loins of evil people. This is perfectly possible. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever is held back by his deeds will not be hastened on by his lineage. That whoever is held back by his deeds, meaning his deeds are few, his sins are many, his good deeds are many, he can't expect a noble lineage to save him. You can't expect a noble lineage to save you. So the point I'm making here is that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, is encouraging us to learn lineage, not to fall into the trap that some people have of lording over others because of lineage, but simply for the goal of finding out who our relatives are and maintaining those ties of kinship. 
And that is a final hadith that Imam Bukhari quotes in this section of hadith uh, to do with the ties of kinship. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes all of us from amongst his servants who study the deen of Allah and take the best of their understanding and practice it as much as possible. Who do our utmost to maintain the ties of kinship, the obligatory and the recommended. And just as a final point, just a summary of, of what we've learned so far from these uh, 30, 40 hadith we covered in, in the previous sessions. So we've learned that maintaining the ties of kinship is an obligation. We, we said today that some scholars have mentioned that there are some ties of kinship that are an obligation and some that are strongly recommended. We've learned that the closer the ties of kinship, the greater the rights they have over us. We've learned that part of our duty to the relatives is to remind them of Jannah and warn them against hellfire. Uh, we've learned that we should call our relatives to Islam. If they're non-Muslims, call them to Islam. If they're Muslims but not practicing Islam, call them to practicing Islam. We've learned that Allah maintains connections with those who maintain the connections of the, of the kinship and breaks from those who don't. We've learned that the womb will speak on the last day and that it will have an unfettered, eloquent tongue. And we have learned that Allah will listen to the complaint of the, of the Rahim. Allah will listen to the complaint of the ties of kinship. And that his complaint carries weight with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've learned that joining ties of kinship is a cause for Allah's mercy to descend upon us. It's a cause for Allah's blessings to descend upon us. We've learned that maintaining the ties of kinship is a means for our life being prolonged and extended. And it's a means for an increase in barakah in our lives. It's an increase in blessings in our lives. We've learned that Allah loves those who maintain the ties of kinship. We've learned that maintaining the ties of kinship is a means to entry into paradise. We've learned that the reason why we maintain ties of kinship is that it's a consequence of our taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've learned that Allah does not accept the deeds of someone who breaks the ties of kinship. We've learned that severing the ties of kinship can be done for personal motives or for religious motives. And we covered both cases as to what to do in each, either case, for personal motives and for religious motives. We've learned that priority in spending is on those relatives that are in need that are close to us, over other people who may require charity. We've learned that the best dinar is the one that we can spend on our fam is the one that we spend on our family. The best money we spend is the money we spend on our family. We've learned that Allah's mercy will not descend on a nation that encourages breaking ties of kinship or does not stop people from breaking the ties of kinship. We've learned that the one who severs the ties of kinship will not enter paradise. We've learned that there's no wrong action more likely to bring punishment in this world, in addition to what is stored up for it in the hereafter than severing the ties of kinship and oppression. We've learned about the levels of maintaining ties of kinship, that there's reciprocation, and then there's normal maintaining ties of kinship, and then there's a highest level of maintaining ties of kinship, which is to maintain ties with those who break them from you. We've learned that Allah recognizes this deed even from non-Muslims who then accept Islam. We've learned that we should maintain ties even with those relatives of ours who are non-Muslims. And we've learned that it's recommended to learn lineages so that we can know who our relatives are, so that we know who to maintain ties of kinship with. That's 23 uh, or 24 different points of benefit we've learned from the hadith we covered so far. And inshallah, with that, we'll stop for today with that. Subhanaka wa bihamdik ashadun la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubi ilayk. Any questions?